Indonesia may well be the most underrated and overlooked city country in the world. With 274 million people, it's the fourth most populous country in the world. Only China, India, and the United States have more people. Today, it has the world's 16th largest economy and the largest in Southeast Asia. With a per capita GDP of around $4,300, Indonesians are roughly twice as wealthy as Indians and one-third as wealthy as the Chinese. But forecasts say that by 2050, Indonesia will have the world's fourth largest economy, behind only, once again, China, India, and the United States. Yet for all that, the country rarely gets attention in the international media. China, Japan, India, South Korea, they all seem to exert more influence on the global imagination. For most people around the world, Indonesia is a blank space on the map. Yet all signs point to Indonesia becoming an economic superpower in the 21st century. The country's leadership knows this, and they have launched a number of ambitious new initiatives to solidify Indonesia place in the future. So what is Indonesia doing to make itself a global economic power, and will it work? In this video, we'll explore these questions, but before we get started, make sure to subscribe to our channel for our latest news and analysis on the global economy. And if you like this video, hit the like button. It helps us spread the word. Indonesia is one of the most unusual countries around. It's composed of an archipelago of 18,000 islands, though only about 900 of them are inhabited, including Java. With 145 million people, Java is the world's most populated island, and it's home to Jakarta, the capital and largest city of Indonesia, with more than 10 million people. The Indonesian archipelago separates the Pacific Ocean from the Indian Ocean. This central position means that the islands have been a central part of global shipping routes for centuries. And for thousands of years, the islands have been a magnet for migrating people from all over Asia and the South Pacific. Located at the intersection of South Asia and East Asia, Indonesia has been heavily influenced by the two great historic Asian powers, India and China, and later by European colonial powers. The result is that today, Indonesia is one of the most diverse and multicultural countries in Asia. This can be seen in the fact that the country has six official religions. Although today 90% of the population is Muslim, Indonesia also also counts Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, Protestantism, and Catholicism as official religions. The islands of Indonesia have been trading with India and China since around 400 BC. The influence of those trading partners brought Hinduism and Buddhism to the country from India and Confucianism from China. In the 8th century AD, the islands were home to a powerful Hindu kingdom called Selandra and a Buddhist kingdom called Sri Rilya. That century, Islam began to spread through the islands, eventually coming to dominate over the other cultural influences from India and China. But by the 17th century, a new influence arrived in the region. At first, it was the Portuguese who were looking to break Muslim traders' monopoly over the spice trade to Europe. Later, and more importantly, the Dutch came to the region taking control of many parts of the archipelago. The Dutch established the trading port city of Batavia, which today is known as Jakarta, and made it a central part of their global colonial power. With the exception of a brief period in the early 19th century when the area was under the control of the British, the Dutch would rule the Indonesian archipelago in one way or another until World War II. In 1940, Germany invaded and occupied the Netherlands. The Dutch were no longer in any position to defend their Indonesian territories. Two years later, in 1942, Japan invaded and took control of Indonesia. At first, the Indonesians welcomed the Japanese as liberators, but they quickly grew delusioned when they saw how brutally the Japanese ruled the territory and how ruthlessly they exploited Indonesia's resources. In 1945, Japan was on the verge of losing the war. The Japanese government decided to support Indonesia's nationalist independent movement in the hopes of making Indonesians allies in the war. Japan lost the war and control of Indonesia, but the independence movement remained, and in 1945, the country declared independence from the Netherlands. The Dutch struggled to hold on to the territory, but they were opposed and harshly criticized by the United States, which by that point was supporting colonial independence movements. In 1949, the Dutch Dutch gave up the ghost and recognized Indonesian sovereignty. At first, independent Indonesia was a parliamentary democracy, but in the 1950s, President Sukarno introduced a new political system that he called guided democracy. It was hardly a democracy. Sukarno reduced the power of parliament and massively increased his own powers. With the backing of the army, Sukarno took control of the remaining Dutch companies operating in Indonesia. This made the army very rich. But Sukarno's system was dysfunctional, and in the 1960s, Indonesia 
Indonesia fell into an economic crisis that included massive inflation, unrest grew, and in 1965 communists attempted a coup, seizing key parts of Jakarta. But the army under the leadership of General Suharto crushed the communists, arresting and executing large numbers of insurgents. This shifted the balance of power in Indonesian politics, and in 1966, President Sukarno resigned and handed power over to Suharto. Suharto would rule the country as a military dictator for more than 30 years. Though there were presidential elections every five years, they were a sham. Still, under Suharto, Indonesia became a major oil exporter, especially after the 1973 oil crisis, when crude prices soared. This helped grow Indonesia's economy and began the long, slow process of pulling Indonesians out of poverty. That long journey came to a sudden halt in 1997 and 1998, when the Asian financial crisis spread from Thailand to virtually all of Asia. Indonesia's economy began shrinking and riots broke out. The unrest forced Suharto to resign and in 1999, Indonesia had its first real democratic elections in four decades. In the years since then, Indonesia's economy has healed from the financial crisis. The country has benefited from the great Chinese economic boom, as well as from the rapid growth in other nearby countries like India and South Korea. The relationship with China has been particularly important. China and Indonesia do more than $120 billion worth of trade with each other each year, and China has invested billions into Indonesia through its Belt and Road Initiative. And even though China has ambitious maritime territorial claims in the area of the archipelago, the two countries have so far avoided conflict over those claims. Indonesia's economy is reaching new heights, and the country is becoming a hotspot for new economy startups. There's FinXL, a fintech company that's developing financial products for retail credit. There is iSeller, a developer of tech for online retailers. There's also Gojek, a digital payment tech company, as well as online marketplace Tokopedia, not to mention booking and ticketing company Traveloka, and many others. And today, Indonesia has begun implementing ambitious new plans to make itself a major economic player in the years to come. One key part of that plan is to transform Indonesia into a global center for electric vehicle manufacturing, specifically the batteries used in EVs. It's estimated that Indonesia sits on 21 million tons of nickel, the largest deposit in the world. Nickel is a key metal used in the production of electric vehicle batteries. Indonesia's government under President Joko Widodo has made it a priority to harness that nickel wealth. The country has banned the export of raw nickel in order to incentivize the creation of an EV battery industry inside the country. And if EV batteries are being made in Indonesia, then it makes sense to make electric cars in Indonesia as well. The plan seems to be working. Nickel extraction has exploded in Indonesia in recent years, from 200 metric tons in 2016 to 1,600 metric tons in 2022, an eight-fold increase in six years. But this new industry is not without its problems. In the race to become the world's hub for nickel extraction and EV production, Indonesia has failed to uphold safety standards and people are dying. Indonesia's nickel business, which is dominated by Chinese companies, has suffered a series of deadly accidents that are now causing labor unrest. In December of 2022, two workers at a PT Gunbuster nickel industry smelter died in an explosion and fire that led to protests and riots, which themselves led to the deaths of two people. Then this year, another fire at PT Gunbuster killed one worker and injured six others. In April, two workers at PT Indonesia Morawali Industrial Park were killed when a nickel waste facility collapsed. A researcher at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta warned that poor working conditions are an instant recipe for social tension, if not social disasters. The competitiveness of Indonesia's nickel industry will likely be at stake. The constant disasters in the nickel business have forced attention on Indonesian labor conditions, and what has emerged is ugly. Despite Indonesia having a law that limits the work week to 40 hours, nickel workers often work 50 to 70 hour weeks, with pay as low as 10 US dollars a day. Foreign workers have their passports withheld and are unable to go home until their contracts are finished. Many fall into depression, and some end up taking their own lives. This is becoming a publicity nightmare for Indonesia, and if the country wants to attract foreign investment to its EV industry, it will have to clean up its act. But nickel isn't the only thing going on in Indonesia. 
Indonesia. The country also has a plan to build a new capital city from scratch and to make that city an epicenter of sustainable living and green energy. For years, many said that the idea was little more than a fantasy, but today, development is underway and Indonesia's new capital, named Nusantara, the first phase of the city and the transfer of the title of capital city is expected in August of 2024. By the same time the city is finished, around 2045, it's expected to have a population of around 1.8 million people. The idea behind Nusantara is to relieve the physical and environmental strains of Indonesia's rapidly growing population. The city is being designed to have a circular economy. The idea behind a circular economy is for businesses and households to reduce waste and to recycle as much of the material consumed as possible, so that the same material circles again and again through businesses and consumers. By 2045, it's expected that 60% of Nusantara's waste will be recycled, and by 2035, it's expected that all of the water consumed in the city will be reclaimed through a water treatment system. To prevent sprawl and keep the air clean, the city will be surrounded by an existing forest that will be protected from development. Building this circular economy city could give Indonesia a huge economic boost as well. It's estimated the program will create 4.4 million jobs and raise the country's economic output by $45 billion annually by 2045. If it works, the plan will be a win-win-win for Indonesia's people, investors, and the environment. To be sure, there's a lot that can go wrong with Indonesia's plans. If the problems in the nickel industry aren't fixed, Indonesia could develop a reputation as a bad place for workers to move to and a risky place for investors to put their money. And planned cities like Nusantara have been attempted before, with mixed results. And Nusantara's plans to create new economic systems that haven't been tried at this scale before means that there is more risk involved in this city than in other similar projects. So far, only 8% of the city has been built. Another risk is that the city is President Widodo's pet project, and his term in office ends in 2024. Will future Indonesian presidents support Nusantara? That's yet to be seen. But if the government and its partners in the business community stick to the plan for Nusantara and develop the city wisely, it could be a global hub of green technology and sustainable living innovation within a few decades. And if Indonesia's government gets its act together on labor safety, the country could easily become a major center of electric vehicle production. Indonesia is at a crossroads. Its plans are aiming in the right direction, but their execution is uncertain. Within the next decade or so, we will find out whether this country, so often overlooked by the rest of the world, will be a new power in the 21st century. If you like this video, be sure to hit the like button, which helps us spread the word about this channel. And don't forget to subscribe to get notifications on our latest videos. In the meantime, check out one of these videos here to learn more. Thanks for watching.